Hello, it is Plurus. Thanks for joining us again and welcome back to another exciting and informative video on our YouTube channel. If you are joining us for the first time, we want to thank you for watching. In this episode, I will be diving into the reason why Africa is not poor, but we are stealing Africa's wealth and resources. I will look into some figures here and discuss analytical information, bring you historical perspective, Africa's interaction with the global community from business to operational activities around the world and the reason why it is time to change the way we talk and think about the continent of Africa. I will encourage you to watch this video to the end for clarity and better understanding. So without any more delay, let's just dive straight into it. It is a simple statement repeated through a thousand images, newspaper stories and charity appeals each year across the globe, so that it takes on to the weight of truth. When we read it, we also reinforce assumptions and stories about Africa that we have heard throughout our lives and we reconfirms our images of the continent of Africa. But that is different. Try to do something different. Try to think differently about the continent. Africa is rich. The good year is that we are stealing the words from the continent of Africa. That's the perspective from lots of other Africans around the world and also those who are other friends of Africa. Considering the geopolitics in the region, based on a set of new figures, the notion that the continent of Africa is extremely poor has been pushed forward by international media in several ways. Africa does have its own challenges, don't get me wrong. However, the continent has made great stride in a number of areas. If you look at those perspectives from different areas, Based on my analysis, it has also been found that Sub-Saharan Africa is a net creditor to the rest of the world to the tune of more than 41 billion US dollars. Such, there is money going on around over 160 billion a year in the form of loans, remittance, those working outside of Africa and sending money back home if you look at different figures. But there is also 203 billion living the continent of Africa. Some of this is direct, such as the 68 billion in mainly dodgy taxes essentially multinational corporations steal much of this legally by pretending they are also really generating their world in tax havens these so-called illicit financial flows amount to around 6.1 percent of the continent's entire gross domestic product the gdp or three times what african receive in terms of aid then there is the 30 billion that those corporations repatriates profits they make in Africa but send back to their home countries or elsewhere to enjoy their world. The city of London is awash with profits extracted from the land and labor of the continent of Africa. There are also more indirect means by which we pull world out of Africa. Today's report estimated that over 29 billion a year is being stolen from African continent in illegal lodging, fishing and also trading in wildlife. Over 36 billion is owed to Africa as a result of the damage that the climate change will cause to their societies and also economics as they are unable to use fossil fuel to develop in the way that Europe did. Our climate crisis was not caused by Africa. But Africans will feel the effect more than most others. Needless to say, the funds are not clearly forthcoming. Looking at the current issues in Paris, where African leaders spoke clearly as to the reason why the $100 billion that was promised a couple of years ago hasn't been given so far. If you look at Africa's lost billions, in fact, even this assessment is enormously generous based on my own research because it assumes that all of the world flowing into Africa is benefiting the people of that continent. But loans to governments and the private sector at more than 50 billion can turn into unpayable and also obduce debt. Ghana is losing 30% of its government's revenue to debt repayment paying loans which were often made speculatively based on high commodity prices and carrying whooping rates of interest. One particularly obvious aluminum smelter in Mozambique, built with loans and aid money, is currently costing the country over £21 for every £1 that the Mozambique government received. British aid, 
which is used to set up private schools and health centers, can undermine the creation of decent public services, which is why such private schools are being closed down in Uganda and in Kenya. Of course, some Africans have benefited from this economy. There are now around over 160,000 very rich Africans with combined holdings of over 860 billion US dollars. But given the way the economy works, where do those people mainly keep their wealth? In tax havens. A 2014 estimate suggests that rich Africans were holding a massive 500 billion in tax havens. African people are effectively robbed of wealth by the economy, and that enables a minority of Africans to get rich by allowing wealth to flow out of the continent of Africa. If you look at different perspectives, so what is the answer? Western governments would like to be seen as generous beneficiaries doing what they can do to help those unable to help themselves. But the first task is to stop perpetuating the harm they are doing. Governments need to stop forcing African governments to open up their economy to privatization and their markets to unfair competition. If you look at different aspects, if African countries are to benefit from foreign investment, they must be allowed to even help to legally regulate that investment and the cooperation that often brings it. And they might want to think about not putting their faith in the extractive sector. If you look at different areas, with few exceptions, countries with abundant mineral resources and wealth, experience poorer democracy, weaker economic growth and also worse development. If you look at the case in the region, to prevent tax dodging, government must stop prevaricating on actions to address tax havens. No country should be tolerated companies with subsidiaries based in tax havens operating in their country. Aid is tiny and the very least to say that cannot provide Africans with the much needed development and growth. If you look at different aspects and the very least it can do if spent well is to return some of africans looted world we should also see it both as a form of repatriation and redistribution just as the tax system allow us to redistribute world from the richest to the poorest within individual societies in international and developed countries the same should be expected from the global society as well if you look at other areas as we conclude this episode to even begin to embark on such an ambitious program we must change the way we we talk and think about Africa. It's not that about making people feel guilty, but correctly diagnosing a problem in order to provide a solution. We are not currently helping Africa. Africa is rich. Let's stop talking it's poorer and also look at the development that has emerged within the continent. If you consider Africa's perspective, as Africa continues to emerge and also play a global role, if you look at Africa's interaction, considering what's happening in Niger, what's happening also in Burkina Faso, and also currently how France is pulling out its presence, France is one of those countries that has manipulated and also extort African countries in the region and also interfer in their internal development, economy, and also political sphere, which has implicated in several ways. We want to thank you for watching. Hopefully, we can begin to think differently with regards to how we perceive the continent of Africa and its people. Africa has made a great stride, and the continent, with regards to the African continental free trade implementation phase at the moment, it does make an incredible growth and development. We want to thank you for watching. We're looking forward to meeting you soon in our next episode. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, uh, President Macron. I just want to make two brief comments. Last year, we were here for another financing conference. And a critical decision that we took last year referred to the expansion of the SDR allocation. And the idea was that the countries of Africa would get a greater share, a greater part of that allocation. That didn't happen. The traditional formula was applied. And I think that what that tells us is that whatever it is that we want to propose here, we need also to dial into the details of those proposals so that we have a realistic chance of having the proposals implemented. The second, finance is a major challenge for the nations of Africa.
to initiate the, the adaptation and mitigation measures that are needed to confront the climate crisis. We have large sums of money that are readily available on the continent which can be brought into play. And I refer to the huge sums of money that are taken out of the continent illicitly. We've been told ever since Thabo and Becky's committee that we're dealing in the order of a hundred billion dollars a year annually of monies that are taken out of the continent illegally, illicitly. One can imagine the significance of bringing this money into play. Were we able to plug the loopholes that permit these uh, outflows to take place? What I would suggest is that we recommend that the African Union and the G7 OECD countries establish a working committee to deliberate on this matter and make recommendations for action by the two groups. We can talk about a three to six months period. A lot of work has already been done in this area, but we need to have a dual approach to how these matters can be resolved. And I believe that if we're able to do that, we would make a tremendous uh, impact on the financial problems that bedevil the African continent. So I would suggest that if there is agreement around this idea, that we find a place in the summit declaration for the, for the idea of this joint working committee. I'd like to end by saying that, um, like all my colleagues, we want to thank you, President Macron, for bringing us together. We also thank our sister, Mia Motley, for the important part she played in preparing the grounds for this summit. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Président. Je vais peut-être donner la parole à Mme Amélie pour qu'elle puisse rendre compte.